Good morning. I'm Corby Kummer, Executive Director of Food and Society at the Aspen Institute. And I'm thrilled that you're here uh, joining us this morning and by live stream. Um, and I'll start with a couple of the things that Food and Society does, because everything we do is kind of modeled on the work that these two panelists do. So you're going to be understanding people who act, find solutions, and make change, and we've got two fabulous change makers with us this morning. So Food and Society, during the pandemic, changed our lives, changed everybody's lives, changed these two people's lives, as we're going to be hearing about a lot. Uh, and I think I met Matt Joswiak of Rethink Food when I was um, doing our COVID safety guidelines for food service workers, which called Safety First. And, it's gone through many, many evolutions of how to keep uh, restaurant workers and diners safe during the different stages of the pandemic. And the work and the beat goes on. Our Food is Medicine Research Action Plan, uh, which is based on equity in, in research design as well as implementation. Another big mistake researchers can make when they go into communities without an understanding. First, what does the community need uh, and it's often not what we think the community <laughs> needs. And I think that LaToya Meters will be telling us a lot about that today. So trying to um, sell researchers on that is part of what we've been doing. And, and the White House asked us to present for the White House Conference on Hunger and Nutrition that's coming up, which I hope you'll all be following in September. First time in 50 years the White House has paid attention to nutrition. So that's a very big deal. Um, then conversations on food justice, something that these two people live every day. Uh, and our next one will be Tuesday, and it's about um, quick serve and the complicated history McDonald's and other quick serve restaurants have had with African American <laughs> communities, which I guess could get Latoya started. We haven't even mentioned it yet, but you can tune in Tuesday to our conversation on food justice. And then our, our most exciting new initiative is our Food Leaders Fellowship, including a food justice fellow. And we've just selected our first cohort of 18, which will be meeting right here in two months, and we're incredibly excited about it. And Matt Joswiak and Latoya Meters are founding mentors of our food leaders. They've just agreed on this very stage that they're <laughs> going to be. I'm, I'm committed. I'm committed. <laughs> that they are going to be <laughs> mentors. So uh, let me introduce what Matt and Latoya do. They're in New York City. They're making huge change within New York City, both in the food systems and in different neighborhoods, day by day and uh, donation by donation. So Matt, we're gonna start with Matt and we're gonna hear about the model of understanding how all kinds of unused food, there's plenty of unused food and there's plenty of people who need it. How do you combine the two and how do you get that unused food to the people who need it? Rethink and, and Matt have come up with a really interesting new kind of model that keeps food within the communities that need it, made by people within the community. Um, and then LaToya is one of the exciting partners who herself at Collective Fair, uh, which is F-A-R-E, and it's dot com. She excitingly does both for-profit and non-profit work. Uh, in East Brooklyn and other communities. And she's become uh, one of the many active and inspiring partners that Rethink has. Um, but Matt, can you tell us about how you got from making super expensive meals in the world's best and fanciest restaurants to um, delivering food all over New York and collecting it from some of those restaurants? Sure, yeah, and thank you, and thank you for having me on this panel. It's, uh, it's an honor and also, for the food safety guidelines that um, ah. were put into effect that help thousands of restaurants uh, keep their staff safe. So I wanted to thank That's you only because we had input from people like you who were on the ground. <laughs> well, it went a really long way, so I appreciate it. Um, and uh, yeah, so I was, a, I was a cook for a, a really long time. I worked at restaurants like I love Madison Park and Noma and Copenhagen. Um, Say I worked... them slowly so people can understand. <laughs> These are among the world's best restaurants. They win every award. Matt was central in their kitchens. <laughs> Well, I, uh, I was lucky. I, I, I'm a little more humble than that, Corby. I, <laughs> I try to be, but I, I uh, no, it was a. I learned a lot in all these kitchens, and I really tried to understand food service as a whole. So, not only working in restaurants like that, I tried to work at fast casual restaurants. I tried to work at hotels. I tried to understand um, because I wanted to be a food entrepreneur. I wanted to open up restaurants of all different, all different capacities. 
And so um, I was lucky enough to have a, a 12 year career across a variety of different places and truly understand operations, which was always my goal in, in food systems, not just how to make a beautiful, you know, vegan dish at 11 Madison Park, even though I was there before it was vegan, but uh, uh, how to make like, you know, how to serve a thousand people really, really tasty food in a safe way. Um, and then somewhere along the line, I started volunteering and getting involved in just teaching kids how to cook and dealing with all these stuff. And I recognized that in the emergency food system, the nonprofit food system, it's simply an operational problem. There's enough food, there's actually more than enough food to have healthy, delicious meals for, for everybody at low cost, no cost. It was simply just logistics and operations that need to be put together in a more thoughtful way to use this food and to use this food. You have to slow down because you start out like everybody should have recognized this. So why were they recognizing it and how did you make it reality? Well, there, there's this myth, right? Like in pre-COVID where, you know, everybody thinks it's illegal to donate your food or, you know, if you donate your food on Monday by Friday, somebody else is gonna own your restaurant because they're gonna sue you. Like it's, it's completely nonsensical and just completely false. Um, the Food Donation Act, uh, the Good Samaritan Act protects anybody who donates food from that. I think most people know that by now. And so when I was a cook, when I was a sous chef, I remember, um, you know, asking the executive chef, like, why don't we donate all this beautiful food? And he would say, oh, it's illegal or the liability. And, and as an uneducated cook from Wisconsin, I heard the word liability and I was like, oh God, like, you know, <laughs> we can't do that. So it, it scared everybody away. And what COVID did, which was one of the silver linings of COVID was restaurants only method was to donate their excess food. The only thing that they could do was, was utilize their excess food. So <clears throat> it kind of squashed that myth. And that's why this time in, in food in sustainability and in food insecurity is so actually exciting because there's an opportunity now that that myth is gone for every restaurant, every food business to participate and you know, systematically you know, solve this problem. When you say the Good Samaritan Law, just refresh people's uh, minds what it means because this was a huge problem and then it got solved and nobody knows about it. Yeah, the Good Samaritan Act basically just says that if you donate food in good faith that you are protected um, from any type of liability whatsoever. So as long as you're donating it to a 501c3, you are completely covered. Um, and then uh, the NRDC is currently working to expand it and um, have it so restaurants can actually donate directly to individuals and then also protect it so people can sell the food, be protected and sell it at a low cost or no cost model, which is, it's the, the future of folks fighting food insecurity. It's low cost, no cost. So how did you start, we're gonna hear about Latoya's parallel journey and her partnership with you, but how did you start getting people to give you food and describe some of the food, and especially during the pandemic, what that food turned into, and then turning it into meals and distributing them. Yeah, well, I think that I knew, um, you know, the, the, the culinary background was really helpful. And I also, like, when I went to Daniel Hume and talked to him about this at 11 Madison Park, he's the, the chef owner, you know, he also knew that I knew that they had excess food, so there was really, like, no excuse. Secret. Yeah, there was, <laughs> you know, so it, it was really, uh, I think because of my background, I could easily say to people, like, I know, it's, like, it's okay, everybody has it, like, we'll figure it out. Um, and then during the pandemic, uh, you know, it was really just completely eye-opening as everybody, kind of, the food system just completely stopped for 12 weeks. So, you know, I remember, uh, you know, cases that would fill this stage five times over of beautiful porterhouses from Keen's Steakhouse that, you know, we distributed to Latoya and other community centers that were, were going to go to waste. Frozen packs of lobster um, from lobster shops. So we were actually doing surf and turf dishes for community centers at the height of, at the height of COVID. It was, it was actually quite incredible. COVID kind of changed your business model and, and your whole life as it changed all of our lives. But how long had you been operating during COVID? And then how did it change the way you distribute meals and the kinds of places you distribute them to? We were around for about a year or so before operationally uh, functioning, collecting all kinds of incredible things, cases of cheese and beautiful potatoes from 11 Madison Park and things like that, and, and making them into great meals. But the, the, my lesson, and, and you know, to be vulnerable, was Rethink wasn't listening. We were cooking all this food, and we honestly weren't listening enough to the communities. And when we needed to scale, uh, we were talking with some board members pretty late at, late at night and saying, 
well, why don't we just open like a bunch of rethink commissaries across New York? And one of Vaughn, who you know very well, was very, very adamant about this and simply said like, that's dumb. Like you have all these incredible community centers, you have all these incredible restaurants all across New York, the capacity is there, the restaurant space is there, the people are there, the teams are there, um, kosher food, halal food, all these things are available for you to produce. Like why in the world would you ever consider opening up anything? And so we went around and, and you know, Latoya, I had actually just toured the facility, uh, her, her uh, nonprofit before, um, right before COVID, and she came to mind and I was like, this is somebody who's being really innovative and completely understands the community and is very like kind of, we say like the micro grid, like there's no blanketed way that you can approach this problem. So it's really just about using cash and food to support entrepreneurs in this space. And that's really what Rethink does. And then when we found Latoya, we supported her through both those methods to uh, help make culturally appropriate, beautiful food for the Brownsville community. So talk about, and then Latoya, we want to know about your model. Talk about a little about the partnership and how that exemplifies what, how Rethink works with other organizations. Yeah, I mean, we just, I think that the, the kind of food distribution model is kind of this like drip down effect that we realize that that's actually like really not effective. We look at it as like a network. And so we just have a lot of really vulnerable discussions with each other. Uh, a good three hour vulnerable discussion last night. Right. <laughs> <laughs> like a, uh, you know, and, and with all of our partners and talking to them and listening to them and, and, and us trying to, uh, and, and then me, you know, telling Latoya, like I'm in this pinch with like, you know, my board's always after me about cost per unit. And so if you're making extra meals using like the Rethink Grant, like, you know, this would help, you know, just being in, having these open and honest discussions about what's gonna help Rethink. And, and she's done tremendous amounts of work to help promote Rethink and help Rethink grow, um, has led to like a really successful, really strong network. Latoya, network, and how you started network, and you came to culinary work through um, what sounds like a very normal path for culinary people, which was electrical engineering. <laughs> <laughs> She's a certified electrical engineer. Um, and she would go up and she would get, what was it called, high pay? Going up on top of buildings for wireless antennas that you would like make really good money in electrical engineering, but always had a love of food. Absolutely. So I started my career, uh, like most culinaries, I went to Johnson & Wales and I wanted to be a chef. Um, got into the industry and this was like early 90s, uh, early 2000s. You didn't make a whole lot. And at the time I had a child, so I was thinking, okay, what is the next thing that I can do? Well, I like electricity. So I segued out of the, uh, the culinary industry, went and got a degree in electrical engineering, uh, became an electrician, IBW Local 3, uh, but I still ran a catering company because I love food. Just, I don't know any way, shape, or form to explain my love of food, my uh, value of food, is sustenance, it's love. It means a lot to nurture someone with food. Um, so that was always something that I, that I did. Um, then I left the electrical industry uh, to start, um, to form another nonprofit in which we did a workforce, culinary uh, workforce development training program because I'd already started working in workforce in the electrical and construction trades. Um, we launched that construct that program, then Collective Fair was born out of that, uh, which was a full service catering food production and culinary education program. So we were working in these communities, Brownsville, East New York, East Brooklyn, because we realized the issue isn't about lack of food, it's lack of education. How do we shop with our EBT and SNAP cards? How do we begin to look at how to go to certain places and buy, purchase food? Um, as we are always talking about with, with in regards to food waste, you have this whole set of food that's just sitting out there, wonderful food, and then you have a whole communities that don't have access to it because the food system really has not garnered in a way where these communities can access that food. So during COVID, we sort of got a, you know, everything just opened. So you got a chance to look at the food system, look at what are some of the, the issues that we were having, and then how do we support these communities in allowing them to be able to uh, to access the food that's, that's, um, that's around. Could you talk, when, when Matt was talking about what do the communities actually need rather than your beautiful surf and turf, 
Could you describe what some of the communities, African as opposed to, or African Caribbean, some African American, what is the food that they need and how that changed the kind of food you produce? Absolutely. So Collective Fair, we actually do Afro-diasporic food. So we do Southern, we do African, we do Caribbean. Across the board, we have uh, a myriad of different chefs that work in our organization, all from various backgrounds. Um, how we find, found out what the community wants is we literally went and asked them through community food surveys, through uh, produce distributions, through all sorts of different ways. Um, text, text to phone. Um, what do you think about this kale? Have you ever heard of dinosaur kale? Um, do you know what food sovereignty is? Do you understand that you're living in a food desert? Like basic questions that you would think that someone that's going through a situation would know. And then that's when we realize this is the lack of education. Um, those of us that you know, have read all the books about food sovereignty, those of us that have, you know, have high level educations, we're not on the ground. We don't have boots on the ground. And by the ability for us to get into these communities, talking with the people, understanding their basic wants and needs, um, the type of vegetables, you know what I mean? If you come from a Caribbean island, um, kale is not the, your green of choice. Kalalu would be your green of choice. So uh, I would therefore take that information go to a community farm uh, and say, hey, I need this much uh, kalaloo grown because I want to create these meals out of that. So there's a full, uh, how, how do I say this? The solution to the issue is not one-sided. It's so many different parts of it. It's a fully uh, systematic approach and you can't just think about the access to food, you have to also think about the agriculture of food. You have to think about how people eat food uh, and how they consume food. Um, most, some people are not interested in prepared meals. Some people want to learn how to cook these fresh vegetables. And that helps contribute into food, uh, preventing food waste as well. Um, if you give someone a butternut squash and they don't quite know how to peel it because it's huge, that butternut squash goes to waste. We literally have to throw it away. But if I, taught you, if I taught you how to roast it, if I taught you how to peel it, that's a different sort of uh, a skill set now. Matt, when you're going around, I'm so impressed that Matt, Matt just knocks on a door and people give him stuff. Um, <laughs> so when you go to the back door of Trader Joe's and Whole Foods, how is it you get them to give you stuff, and then describe the Parmigiano Reggiano last week, and who did it come from? And, and then to be frank, why you? Why do they give it to you and not food banks or established places that take this kind of food? Yeah, um, you know, the, the food bank, and I think there's like the, uh, a confusion about what the food banking system generally does in this, in this whole thing. With the, the supply chain at, the, at the, the top of it, you know, like basically, you know, you're looking at a, a semi-truck full of potatoes. Rethink has no need or want or capacity or ability to move a semi-truck full of potatoes. But Food Bank and City Harvest can do it really, really well, really, really quickly. So we, we like to kind of stay in our, in our uh, just stay in our lanes and do what we do best. So with Rethink, we, we think about, we think a lot about sustainability and sustain food sustainability is really hard. It's hard to donate food. It's hard to package everything in the right place. And so we work with these organizations to give them guidelines, structure. We show up on time. We're in our uniforms. We have the you know food donation you know temperature guns ready to go to make sure that everything's safe. And like we're very 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 thoughtful. And with a lot of our clients that we work with, we're charging them for it. We're, we're making them, them pay us to do this because it's expensive and, and philanthropy is not is not a dependable revenue model for sustainable growth. And so we're really, really focused on actually building a certification around it um, called Rethink Certified, where if you wanna know if you're local, and we have the map up on rethinkfood.org, but if you wanna know if your Trader Joe's is donating excess food and how much is donated and where did it go, you can go to rethinkfood.org and start to understand that. So we're building some interesting technology to help keep businesses accountable um, around their ESG goals, and, and we can provide more of a, a long way of saying is that we provide a more robust service than just, you know, put the stuff in the bin and we'll But also when you say accountable, because he kept using the word accountability last night, and I said, what does it mean? There's so many meanings of accountability. Like, do you try to keep track of when you give people food, like Latoya, who turned down a pallet of bacon? So describe the turning down the pallet of bacon. Well, back to cultural, uh, cultural relevance in food, right? 
um, in many communities. So during the pandemic, we ran, I ran an emergency food hub out of our location with uh, support from Rethink and various other organizations. And we were doing about 10,000 meals a week and we were doing uh, 14,000 pounds of fresh produce. At that time, we were also taking in all of this excess food. I have a 20,000 square foot space, refrigeration hub, everything just rocking. Uh, the food that we, so at that time, we were bringing in like all of these foods coming in and I had to check them all. And I had to verify whether or not the community is even gonna use this food. So I got a, it was an 18 foot truck, 18 wheeler, and it was filled with bacon. And I was like, well, I'm in a black community. Uh, this is not going to work well. Because if you uh, look at it this way, you have a high rate of uh, people that uh, religious, you have uh, cultural norms inside black communities that bacon isn't, you know, either we're not gonna eat it or due to religious rights, they're not gonna, you know, so it was something that would have went to waste in that community. So I had to turn it away. There was no way I would be able to put that into meals, especially the meals that we produce, which are geared around health and wellness. Um, all the food that we cook is plant-based, plant-forward. Yes, we cook proteins, but we look at how do we create healthy ways because in these same under-marginalized communities in which I service, there's high rate of chronic disease, high rates of, uh, of, of, of chronic illness, which are very preventable if served proper food. So we have, to we have to take thought and be very intentional at everything that we cook and that we're putting into the community, um, which in lies some of the issues that we see in the food space is you think that feeding people just has to do with I gave you food. It has to do with what kind of food I gave you. It has to do with the energy that you put inside the food. It has to do with the collectiveness of the community that goes inside that dish. So we really think uh, holistically around how, do we, how we feed people and what that food, how it impacts their lives. Great, and Matt, you haven't talked about, okay, do you all know what CBO means? No, you don't. All right, you know. It's a community-based <laughs> organization. And um, you work, you both work with a ton of them, but that's been one of the Rethink main models is you approach them, you get contracts and say, I will bring and make you meals for X amount of dollars that your board's always holding you to. Yes. Um, how do you find them and name some of these organizations you uh, give food to every week? Yeah, yeah, uh, you know, Hungry Monks is one of the biggest food distributors in Queens. Uh, Rap for Bronx is one of the biggest distributors in, in the Bronx. And um, uh, Hungry Monk is really just, I mean, Father Mike is- Yeah, he's awesome. Awesome, out of, <laughs> out of his mind. Um, Have you ever heard of Father Mike? Father Mike is a cult in New York City. Describe Father Mike a little. Uh, Father Mike is a, um, a uh, I don't even know how to do this. He's a he's cigar, cigar smoking, smoking. <laughs> rum drinking, Gregorian monk who lives in Ridgewood, who uh, drives vans around and he's collects. A, he's an actual father. Yes, like, <laughs> it's like for real. Um, and who will find old abandoned church, churches and for like, $800, scrap together people in the community, completely fix them up, make shelters out of nothing. He's, he's a magician. I mean, he's really just an incredible uh, individual. And uh, yeah. But you make food for his groups. Yep, we make food for his groups, for his shelters. Um, but something that we learned during COVID is, you know, we, and we learned this the, in a very painful way. We were trying to distribute, we, 11 Madison Park was the first restaurant or the second restaurant that we actually activated um, when we were doing these restaurant response grants in March of 2020. And we realized uh, we brought couscous and roasted cauliflower and tofu into Harlem and I almost got oh. killed. Like, <laughs> and it was basically like, what are you doing? And so like, and so we very, very quickly realized, and I got, I, I met a, a really good friend of mine, Lloyd Williams. And so I was like, Lloyd, I'm doing this all wrong. And he's like, look, like, let's work with Salem United Methodist Church. Let's go to the Chamber of Commerce and let's go find five Harlem based businesses to cater Salem United Methodist Church for three months. And let's basically do Taste of Harlem for this community. And it's really, really beautiful. And it's actually still going on today, actually today, right now, uh, well, a couple hours in New York City. Um, and we've been working with these restaurants and it's been absolutely incredible. So we've started by, when we work, we work with about 54 restaurants across the country. We actually start by going to the community-based organization and saying like, is there a restaurant in the neighborhood that you like? 
do you like this food? Is there people in the neighborhood that, that cook that you like? And they'll usually have like a litany of restaurants that, you know, restaurants are the best nonprofits, I say this all the time, that they've either like fundraised through or done like, you know, events with or donated with or had a partnership with in some way. And they'll be like, yeah, of course, we want Manna's Soul Food to make the meals for Salem United Methodist Church. And um, it really, it, it's, it's kind of easy. <laughs> it isn't easy. I mean, but what you're constantly saying, it's the systems that have to do it. Latoya, where do you find the organizations? And are, does, does Matt bring you food or does he bring you money on so, an 18-wheeler? <laughs> so my organizations are a little bit built a little bit different, which is uh, what, uh, so I run a for-profit nonprofit model. It's Collective Fair, which is a full-service uh, catering and food production com food processing company now, um, and I'll explain the pivot, um, which is natural. And I also have a I'm the founder of uh, 501c3 uh, Collective Food Works, which is geared in uh, cr uh, creating. Uh, micro food systems inside communities, as well as workforce development, because they're all tied together. You help a community um, build a food system, you can also get economic development out of that and create a more sustainable uh, community for, uh, for uh, communities that have lack of access. So I actually got started doing that out of the pandemic. Um, we started with the uh, full-scale food production and then we moved on to, um, and then at, during that time too, we were also, while people were staying at home, we were doing a series of uh, virtual training, virtual culinary training. My Amazon and Instacart game is sick, y'all. I'm just gonna let you know. Everyone was getting bags of groceries, everyone was getting knife kits from Amazon, anything that we could leverage to create a more um, inclusive environment for everyone. Uh, we had people that were in transitional housing and they, did, they had uh, hot plates. So I taught you how to make really dope meals on hot plates. Um, because, again, that connectedness to food is what's really important. Matt, I, I forbade Matt to show a PowerPoint, um, which is one of my policies, no PowerPoints. But you have a fantasy of zero-cost meals. Um, and can you describe some of that? Because I want to really uh, drill down a bit into food waste and new models of thinking of how to eliminate food waste or turn it into meals. Yeah, I think, you know, this is what Latoya and I, you know, bonded on was the reality is, is that um, the government is a little antiquated and, 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 sorry, I don't know if I'm allowed to say what I'm allowed to say, but I just, <laughs> the government is helpful Anyone in some way. government right? I mean, let's just say it. We need a, we need an upgrade button, you know, yeah, that exactly. Android iPhone needs to reset on America <laughs> a bit. <laughs> Especially on the food stuff. I think that they do great. Moving on, I think um, you know the the uh, the reality is is that there there's a and what I loved about what I what I about our relationship what we talk about all the time is you can build this perpetual motion machine and that's what I've been chasing for five years. I always thought as a cook I was like well I'll just take you know some of this food I'll make stuff and I'll sell it and then I'll use that money to collect excess food and distribute it. And it'll all work like in a really easy, simple way. And it like was incredibly hard and did not work <laughs> at all. And so over time, I've realized that you know there is this kind of regenerative process. So we work like with 11 Madison Park and uh, a lot of fine dining restaurants. Every diner that comes in, they, they make a donation. Um, I know that sounds small, but it actually leads to about half a million dollars a year just from 11 Madison Park, 2,000 meals a week. Um, and then they utilize their excess through that revenue stream. And it, this is where it all gets very complicated, which Corby told me not to get complicated, but like it just, it's very possible, very, very, very fixable because we have the things that we need. We have incredible infrastructure already built. It's already there, right? Like there's like restaurants and people who want to cook and Gen Z does not want three Michelin stars. They want to fix food systems. They want to be sustainable. They don't, they want to win awards around, you know, being an activist. They're not interested in being the next Gordon Ramsay, mm -hmm. which is incredible. So the talent's there. So the production's there, the distribution's there, the food's there, it's all there. And at Rethink, we talk constantly about how do you put these four things in the right order to actually solve this problem? And again, I was listening to the, the panel last night. So he said, well, lawyers are gonna be at full employment. Well, if there was 40% more lawyers around, you know, it would just be, it would be 10 times impactful, but that's actually the case with food. There's 40% too much. Mm -hmm. And kitchens are only active 50% of the time. 
So there's a, you actually have this ability to solve this problem, and that's what gets us all jazzed up at Rethink. Were you helping keep restaurants alive during the pandemic by uh, they would make meals uh, in the off shift, um, they would go out to congregate meal places and shelters, and the money that you gave them would help them pay the rent, not enough to live on, but enough to subsidize them. Does that go on post-pandemic? Post -pandemic. Post Nobody's gotten post COVID in our lives, right? But I mean, do, does it go on? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's what we do. I mean, we with, with about uh, over 50 restaurants across the country, um, we provide just it, and it's it's kind of interesting, right? Like we've learned that if you provide way too much money, like ten dollars a meal, fifteen dollars a meal, the the business is like, well, why am I focusing on send, selling like twelve dollars sandwiches if I'm making fifteen dollars a meal from this program? So they stop focusing. So we we've got it down to like five fifty a meal, where it kind of the entrepreneur has to focus on primary function, running a great restaurant. Then they utilize their excess to make these meals, and it's this underlying revenue stream for them where they actually end up helping make the business more profitable. We've seen uh, a lot of people open up second locations in Miami. We saw Pax Supermarket, one of the oldest, like kind of Haitian, um, so like basically it's like a supply store for her uh, Haitian products in Little Haiti, um, paint their storefront, redo their floors. We've seen really incredible kind of beautification of neighborhoods because of um, just providing this underlying revenue stream. And for context, Rethink did away like 25, 27 million dollars in the last, you know, two years. Um, the government gave away billions. So we did this with 27 million. If we would have put 700 million into Harlem, it would be one of the most incredible places on the face of the planet. And don't think Matt isn't proposing it. I think. Um, so, Latoya, you mentioned the sense of community and not, all the work you do is just like mind boggling. It's so varied, it's so incredible, it's so inventive. But you said something that really surprised me, which is you didn't know that many other people in New York City who were doing that. Yeah, so, well, not in the culinary industry, rather. I mean, most of the work surrounding food justice are is tethered to food banks, tethered to um, other nonprofit organizations. So in the culinary world, you know, we sort of live in a bubble, especially in New York. Most of the uh, food that we cook is very for, you know, catering events, you know, restaurants. So to really take a step out of that and to look at the whole landscape of food as a culinarian, as someone in the food industry, um, which I know Matt could attest to that, it, it's like, a, it's like a, a, a shock to the system. You know, this chicken that I'm preparing is not just chicken, where did it come from? You know what I mean? And how does, how can, what can I do with that now? And what can I do with these, these talents and these skills? Um, in the community in East Brooklyn, I work along with about 50 different nonprofit organizations. Um, and the way we work with Rethink is allowing for uh, the excess food that we receive from them, as well as the, the cash that we receive. We slam that together, allowing to, uh, to create jobs, uh, allowing to create um, the way that we process the food and what, where in the communities the food is distributed to. So we also look at um, what are the places in need. So during the pandemic, well, during the COVID, I think we're still in a pandemic, I don't even know anymore. Um, we were focused on everyone. And then as things started dying down and places started reopening, we started looking at, okay, where are the really impact, the, the, where, the, where the needs are. Now, a lot of people were saying the seniors, but we were like, okay, in New York, we already have DIFTA, we have all of these other organizations that are really focused on seniors, Meals on Wheels, but who is handling the children in transitional houses? Who's handling um, women and children's services, women that are in, um, in shelters. All of those things are sort of demographics that are lost, so we started targeting that. So a lot of the meals and the programs that we started doing were going into these centers, to, uh, working along with schools, working along with public schools. Um, they have, there's always, in New York, there's a set of a public school um, programs that de directly deal with children in um, transitional housing. So we, we started focusing on that. And then that is why we were able to stay sustainable and we're just doing the work that we're doing today. Great. Um, I have more questions, but I hope you've got a ton. So any questions? And we've got people running mics, and it's um, the gentleman in the front row. So, um, right, right, right. Oh, yes, we have a mic runner. Everyone. Wonderful. So, so um, I was thinking that you were just in New York, but it sounds that 
you're in New York, but you're national, possibly. And, um, you know, we live in L.A., 11 million people, incredible income disparity, a lot of need. And I'm wondering if you're not, do you have thoughts about expanding to, for example, L.A.? Are you already there? Um, and if not you, do you have a replication model that you would be able to either consult or, or help provide guidance for others to do the work that you're doing uh, elsewhere? Uh, we're not, uh, no, we're actually, we're in San Francisco and um, our, our chef uh, that we work with closely is uh, Dominique Kren, if, if you're familiar with her, but she's um, there and she's been talking about it a lot. But we've been looking for, uh, the things that we look for when we go to a new city, we look for a core restaurant that is going to kind of be the, like a very popular restaurant that people are gonna be like, you know, a three Michelin star, two Michelin star restaurant that people are gonna know that are gonna help fundraise. Um, we look for uh, like a, a, a leader of it that's gonna kind of help fundraise, get the, the initial kind of investment down. And then um, uh, it's actually a, a Daniel Hume, a Julian, uh, the chair of our board, and then like a me that's gonna like go out and like hit the pavement and like go out there and really push for that. So. We have our CREN, but we are looking, so anytime we complete that triangle in another city, we open up that city. So, you know, assistance is welcome. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have uh, two questions, but the, uh, the lady in the back uh, lifted her hand first. Oh, nice. Hello, thank you. Hi, my name is Camille Range. I'm a registered dietitian, so this is a very, you know, relevant conversation for me. So Corby, I'm an Aspen Fellow. I'm definitely looking to have a conversation with you. Latoya, I have that shirt in a poster, so I love it. And wow. I definitely want to say I appreciate all of your comments. Um, but my question is, um, being that, oh, and I remember the other thing. When we were talking about the upgrade, I think it's USDA needs that software update, is what we think we were trying to say. There we go. Um, but anyways, my question is, um, from your experience in the global pandemic and over the last couple of years, what have you personally learned through your organizational experience about the social determinants of health that are connected to food, right? We've been working on save hunger, stop hunger for a very long time. What have you learned about the other things related to food that really does impact your nutritional quality? We talk about food insecurity, now we're moving to nutrition insecurity. Your thoughts? Yeah, well, why don't we just say, if you've solved food, why haven't you solved housing yet? So- Oh, I'm, I'm working on that too. <laughs> <laughs> Let me, let, me, let me tell you what I'm doing, right? So on that very point, right, we look at under-marginalized communities, we look at the rate of diabetes in these communities, chronic disease, and we look at all of these preventable diseases, but they're all tied to food. So what we look to do with uh, collective, Fair Collective Food Works is we work along with medical facilities. We've developed a series of diet-related meals. We work along with dietitians. We work along with nurses because the need for culinary professionals and medical professionals to work together, it's needed right now because we, are, we could be the ones to solve the nutrition issues that are happening. And then by solving this also by tying into the excess food, you have your pathway, right? You have your food, you have your medical, you have your culinarians that are the best people to prepare your foods. And that's the, and, and that transporting into um, dealing with the communities, it just bridges a whole gap that otherwise wouldn't have, uh, otherwise that wouldn't have went aside. Um, but yeah, working along with medical professionals is key to, to, uh, to the work that I've been doing over the last few years. Great. Um, that hand in the back and then the hand in the front. But the lady in red. Good morning, Maureen Luna, Miami, Fort Lauderdale area, have a food pantry. It does focus on seniors and we also are in the low income housing uh, tax credit world where we're trying to build work for ca workforce housing. So just a perspective of where I'm coming from. Question, I, and it, it may be directed more towards rethink, we found when we were going to the Trader Joe's and to the Whole Foods and the Publix's, which is our, our chain, we were then challenged with the Feeding South Florida's of the world who then get this, these contracts to get all of the excess food and we felt that some of the local people were squeezed out. Do you find the challenge where, to your point, you don't need the semi, but you're up against 
some of these larger organizations who are doing good. This isn't about them, but how, how, did, you, how did you balance that or manage those relationships? Yeah, you don't have a competitive bone in your body, right? <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, I think it's just through really vulnerable discussion. And look, it is, I think like, you know, um, I, you know, it's, the, the fastest way I can answer this question is when I was a cook, I would go to Per Se and other restaurants in New York City to go learn how to do different things. And that's very normal, it's called staging. And when I opened up Rethink, I thought I could send the part-time person I hired to help with the CBO relationships to another nonprofit and they could stage and learn about the way that they did and I got laughed out of the room. I did not realize at all how competitive this industry is. Mm. And that's why transparency is really important. That's why accountability is really important. But it is, it is, it is competitive. I think that it is getting better because the food insecurity space and the, and the not and the sustainability space are, are finally getting very, very close together, and it's really helpful. And the health space, as we're here today. Um, and what I've learned is, is that now that I just feel like we were competing for for peanuts, you know, as you know, it's like just just scraping by every single month. And like now I feel like there's a more robust community of funders that's helping with that, with that competition. But yeah, I mean, I've gotten, you know, angry emails from other organizations about, oh, you took this thing or you took that thing. And in our mind, we're like, cool, take it. You know, like there's so much food out there. And I'd love to chat too because- I was about to say, he has an appointment with you after this session. Yeah, because I'd love to talk about distribution in Miami as well, because we're, we're doing a lot there, so. That's right, you're in Miami. We had a hand up, th uh, that lady, patient in the second row, and then. Hi, thank you for everything that you're doing. Um, I was a child that was part of the um, SNAP and food bank programs when I was growing up, and TFAP and um, canned beef and evaporated like powdered milk is disgusting. That's not what we eat at my house, so. It was very hard for my family when we were going through difficult times. So it's awesome to hear that you're really speaking to the communities. And I know that you're not part of the like FDA or USDA, but um, I think that they really do need to change the way that they give us food. Because some of that food is honestly really gross. <laughs> um, and I work at a food bank now, so I know exactly like, I see the food that I ate like 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Um, my question to you is now that the pandemic is easing up and the restrictions are easing up, um, would you have like cooking classes for families where they can learn how to cook? I know our food bank is trying to do that with the food that we're provided. Um, so I wanted to know if that's something that you all are looking into. Latoya. No, yeah, that's something, oh, that's something that we definitely do. Uh, we work along with, again, I, our, my organization, one of the things that we do very well is also a lot of collaborative work with other nonprofits because um, it's important for us to all understand what it is that we do well and work together to see how that can create better programs. So we're launching, we're in uh, about seven uh, middle schools and high schools, so we do culinary education tr programs, um, working along with another organization uh, that does ur uh, urban agriculture. Um, inside schools and then we're, we'll come in and they teach the kids how to grow hydroponic, aqua, aquaponic, you know, greens. And then we come in and we actually show them how to prepare those greens into different like pestos and all sorts of things. Um, because it shows the kids, again, their connectedness through food, how it, from the whole life cycle. Um, we also do family programs. We bring the families in, we show them how to uh, utilize their SNAP and EBT dollars, uh, do food costs, do budgets. You know, a lot of the times uh, people get especially during right now, right? EBT and SNAP started giving families like $1,000 a month. But the mindset is, again, uh, always living in scarcity. They shop at the beginning of the month and then all of that shopping that they do is high processed foods, really frozen foods, because they're used to if things run out. How do we begin to change the mindset, focus on uh, getting more fresh foods, understand how to uh, utilize your budget so that you can shop throughout the month? Great. So, we begin I'm to talk about things off, like that. Because we have two more questions. Got it, sorry. The lady in white and the gentleman who I thought was tossing a mic, and it's, he's actually tossing a ball. Okay. Hello, I'm Mary Jo Bolin from Kentucky, and I'm in a rural area. And I love hearing what's going on in New York City, in LA, in Florida. But in this small little rural area, we get um, charged with 
if the food comes to the food bank from a restaurant, that means we, if something went wrong or that family got sick, they follow it back to the restaurant and then they sue us. Mm. So the Good Samaritan Act protects any restaurant from any type of liability in any situation if they donate their food to a 501c3. Okay. So any situation, and, and, and this is a common misconception, and I used to carry around dozens of copies in my backpack walking around New York City. No matter where you are in the country, if you donate your excess food to a 501c3, right. you cannot be held liable under any situation. Right. This is church-based mostly from the churches in the community. And so what has happened now, we collect canned food, mm -hmm. which is awful in a way but it's all just canned food and processed food or frozen food. And then the churches even, once a month, each church takes a time to deliver food to the seniors or anybody that needs food. But guess what they did there? They started cooking, and then during the pandemic they couldn't, so now we're delivering frozen foods. And I love hearing how you all did the culinary and what you're doing. But I don't know how to do that in Kentucky. And I, I have some suggestions for you, and can I finger my colleague now that I've done it, Janet Topolsky. So the queen of rural, the woman who knows more about how to help rural areas than anyone I've ever met is uh, right there. And I fingered her. She's got two sets of glasses on. Gentlemen in the, in, <laughs> gentlemen in the back. <laughs> I think I'm going to reach out to her, too. <laughs> uh, hi, my name is Kwame Liddell. I'm the founder of Nutrable. And what we do is deliver food directly to patients as soon as they're discharged from hospitals. Um, and I love the, the work that you guys are doing because we just haven't thought about food from uh, restaurants or things like that, especially for patients that, who've been eating hospital food for <laughs> quite some time. Um, and, I, and that leads me to think, have you guys, or do you guys have relationships with hospitals or some type of connector to the sick people who, who need it and might not be able to contact, contact you themselves? Yeah, that would, that would be me, I do. I work along with a few hospitals. Uh, we do, uh, we, my team and I, we developed a series of meals uh, uh, for people with diabetes, chronic uh, health, uh, health issues. Uh, we also do uh, patients that are going through um, gastro. So looking at the different uh, ways that people need, need to get food, but also how that food is prepared. So that, that's, what, that's what we've been doing over the last couple of years. And I've been so restrained, I haven't said a thing about food and societies. Food is medicine, research yes. action plan. But it's got a ton of medically tailored meal suggestions for these meals. So I will talk to you. I'm going to suggest that you and everyone in this room um, conduct a listening session or give feedback to the White House as it's preparing its conference on hunger, health, and nutrition because USDA needs your help and your advice. And so everyone can conduct a listening session or just contribute suggestions on the website. I'll be glad to help you. Um, I think you all understand that our Food Leader Fellowship, which we're incredibly excited about, I want them all to grow up to be Matt and LaToya. So thank you very much for coming today.